ladies and gentlemen, give a big hand for John Waters. from yesteryear, it's called a book, you open it up, there are pages, very similar to the things that you scroll. I don't care how anybody reads it, I don't really read it, I don't know. Well, let's talk a little bit about your book. Uh, this is called Car Sick. Two years ago, John decided to uh, hitchhike across the country from his apartment in Baltimore to his other apartment in San Francisco. And uh, so basically what you have is you've got this into three parts. You've got the best that could happen, which is a fictitious account of the best possible outcome, which was kind of, to me, felt like a X-rated uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got the worst that could happen, which is kind of a, a, a very dark road horror story. And then the third chapter is the real thing, which is what actually happened. Um, which, which is optimistic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Compared. So uh, I have to admit, I was kind of relieved by the time I got to that part. My, my assistant said I couldn't tell the difference between the good and the bad. They were all horrible to me. What you think is good? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that. I was like, the, the part, the best outcome felt like somebody else's worst outcome. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> but, um, so did a lot of people try to talk you out of this uh, this adventure? As it got closer, all the people that worked for me were horrified about it. Um, yeah, and I was surprised. Even my friends that are criminals tried to talk me out, but I thought they'd be for it. Uh, the younger the person, the more they sort of liked the idea. And all the younger they were, people would have never hitchhiked, because no one hitchhikes the whole way across the country. I saw one other hitchhiker, and I told my driver, don't pick him up. <laughs> no, 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 that's no. I know, but you know, you, you got to be selfish when you're hitchhiking. They don't... Well, yeah, it's like hitchhiking. Is that even a thing? <laughs> well, people know. A lot of people saw, I had a sign always, and people thought I was so stupid of a homeless person that instead of standing at a red light and begging, I was down on the freeway like, who could pull over and give you a quarter? That, when they see you with a sign now, that's what they think. They don't even know about hitchhiking. A child once, this was another time I was hitchhiking when I was trainer wheels, you know, training to do this. In Provincetown, a family picked me up, and the little kid was in the car staring at me and said, Dad, why is this man in the car? Why did you stop? Who is he? You know, it was really embarrassing because they didn't even know what hitchhiking was. It's like, when was his last film? <laughs> well, no, they didn't. I don't know if they recognized it. I forget if they asked me what I did. I never bring it out. So you did, you did a series of training runs. Any well, no, I did it anyway. I used to have hitchhiking dates. I, it was really a great. Come on, you want to go hitchhiking with me to the beach? Because there's one beach you have to have it. You have to have a sticker to live in that beach, and I didn't have one. So the only way you could go was hitchhike, and it was a 15 mile ride. It was a, a you know not that hard if you didn't make it. And, uh, and in Provincetown, to be honest, people did recognize me, so it was like hailing a limousine in the day. But coming back wasn't. <laughs> coming back wasn't. And I did hitchhike with Patty Hearst once. And I always met the person getting the back. I get in the front, and the man was like looking over like he recognized me. And then he said, oh, are you John Waters? And I said, yeah, and that's Patricia Hearst. He looked in the room in the mirror, and she said, he made me do it. <laughs> Later, her husband was really pissed off. He said, haven't she had enough trouble, John? And it's true. I said, but have I? No. So as somebody who's done, you know, the whole gamut of uh, entertainment, entertainment sort of things, books, uh, movies, acting, voice, everything you can imagine, this guy's done it. Like, what was the impetus for this type of book? An adventure, you know, my life, it was my midlife crisis. I, I don't want to buy a convertible. I, I won't even get in a convertible at my age. But um, I thought I needed an adventure. My life was so planned, so controlled, so safe. Can I give all that up and see what happens? And I did. And I always thought my street cred would go up a little. I was impressed. At 66 years old, I hitchhiked across the country with, yeah. just by myself. With no backup. And, uh, and there were horrible days, you know, when I'm sitting there waiting 10 hours for a car, and uh, 
And it was so hot one day, I would call my assistant and whine all the time. Just say, I have to drink my own urine now. And stuff like that, because I would just be stuck there. And I would run out of water. I didn't do that. But I was like Pink Flamingos. I was living in gas station laboratories someday, which was really humbling. Um, well, you, you, you didn't tell your mother before going, and, uh, and then she found out later. Is she shocked by anything you do? Well, my <laughs> assistant Susan said that she wasn't because you beat her down into submission. But uh, my mother always said that she wasn't shocked by something until then I'd say, okay, well, I'm here. And then she'd say, why would you do something like that? So that wasn't completely true. Oh. My mom unfortunately died this year, but she had a great oh, life and everything. But she did say stuff like, with my movies, or what's this one about? And I'd say, sex addiction. She'd go, oh, maybe we'll die first. <laughs> so, <laughs> The <laughs> only good thing about this book, that, no, the only good thing about my mother passing away is that she won't read this book. Because there are parts in it that would really kill her. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, this, this felt like, uh, you know, this kind of goes back to your roots, your, your really trashy roots, especially the, to the first two uh, novellas. Yeah. Um, how do you... Well, if you think up the best and the worst, they are extreme. They may uh, fight more herds. Well, when a lot of people that, you know, say some of the more, like, housewife type of characters that you met recognize you from, they know you from Hairspray. Is housewife is a politically incorrect word. Oh. Um, well, uh, is there such a thing as a housewife old, anymore? Old like ladies. sitting around with <laughs> eyes and an apron? Sorry. I don't even know if that exists. Sorry, That's old broads. Yeah. No. <laughs> Working moms. Or no, no, I don't know. But um, the people that picked me up in real life were the opposite of the first two chapters. They were um, probably fairly normal, but really sweet, really progressive in how they thought. Completely different than what, I really hate that expression of flyover people, because these were what is snobbily referred to. But to me, they were more liberal and smart than a lot of people I know in Manhattan and LA. They were open to stuff. They just didn't bullshit. You know, they hated freeloaders. That's the main thing. And the most interesting thing, I don't think a gay person picked me up, which was but the straight men, the straight men all talked about how much they loved their wife and how smart she was and everything. Right. They were so, that they helped, it gave heterosexuality such a good name. You know? <laughs> they, have to feel, they have to feel good about themselves, too. So um, that, that was kind of amazing. And, and so all the women I know in New York say, I can never meet a straight man. Go hitchhike on Route 70. The problem is they're all happily married. You have to move to the town early and then find one first. Do you think, I mean, not to, you know, just to, not to poke too many holes in that, but do you think some of them were like, I I'm married, I have a wife. No, 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 I didn't. And the gay thing, one of one guy was a total Republican, and he said to me, you know, I I'm for Obama now that he said he was for gay marriage. When he said he was evolving, that was such bullshit. So, um... They were not always predictable about about how they felt about stuff. Yeah, I mean, I guess p if they're going to pick you up, if they're picking up, a hit, picking up a hitchhiker, they're probably pretty pretty open people. Well, that, I don't know. I never. I, I got a ride in a ninety thousand pound truck, and I never felt gay or climbing up those steps to get in that truck. I felt like a complete fool. You know, this is like a porn joke, right? The guy couldn't have been nicer. He was great. It's what gay bears wish they were. He was a straight bear, but he didn't even know about bears. Can you can you explain for some of our mainstream kind of straight people the fascination with truckers? I, I didn't say I. No, not yours. There's not, I mean, there's not that many people you get a ride with. Uh, oh, you mean the porn fantasy of truckers? Well, yeah. truck stops. I wrote a great best case scenario of an illegal truck stop. And I do have a real trucker friend who's out of his mind. I'd be scared for him to pick me up. He says he carries fake piss for the drug tests. He dumps things on people's lawn if it's coming up if they wait too much. He picks up runaway girls and has sex with them. He jerks off in a sock. And he said, want me to send it to you? I said, no, I don't want you to send it to me. All right. Does that help? Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated. You, um, that's, that's the real part. That's, <laughs> no, that's not the real part. But in the book, I don't have... Oh, the guy is real. Yeah, the yeah. real trucker is real. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, the criminal one, yeah. <laughs> well, there's a line in, in early in the book, and 
you said this a couple times that where you believe in the base of goodness in people. Was that sort of like your thesis statement, or is that what you set out to prove, or was it? That's about as spiritual as I get. <laughs> yeah. I do believe in the base of goodness people. There are people that are born wired wrong, though, yes. But um, I have faith in people. I've taught in prison. I can get along with all kinds of people. I'm not scared of people, and, I, and I'm a good listener. And people will tell me anything. I mean, I always, I get, I've said this before, I get on an airplane, and the stranger will turn next to me and say, my entire family fucked me in an Easter basket on Easter morning. <laughs> Why did they tell me that? <laughs> because I'll understand. <laughs> I mean, well, isn't it so much more interesting to talk to those people than, you know, us? <laughs> no, no, because every, I never understand people say they're bored. Well, walk outside and look at people. I'm never bored. That's the yeah. one thing I never am, because I'm, I'm interested in human behavior. And, and the most that I made the movies about and that I wrote about are people that think they're normal, but to me are really insane. Because most of the people I know in New York that think they're insane are actually kind of normal. So it, it's never always, it's always weird how people conceive of themselves and their own beliefs. Did you find any of that on the road, like uh, people that were, you know, more, did you, were people more insane than you thought they would be, or less? They were neither. They were, I, I don't know that I thought they'd be insane. Um, the people were, I did not get a scary ride. I didn't even get one that was a bad driver. Um, I got 21 rides it took. Um, I got a That's coal miner. Low. Uh, well, right. one the, the the one big character in the book, the, the um, Karate Kid. No, I mean, Corvette. Corvette Kid was um, he was a Republican elected official in Millersville, Maryland, and he picked me up in the pouring rain when he was going to get his lunch at the subway. He didn't know who I was, even after I told him. We just kept talking. He drove me all the way to Ohio. His parents were like horrified. Where is it? He look up John Waters. It's not good if you Google me. It's bad. <laughs> Friends of one of the Manson family, you know, like, oh, great, my kids with him, you know, and uh, and then he went back, and then he kept texting me the whole time, and then he said, I'm coming to get you, and drove 48 hours straight at 80 miles an hour and caught up with me in Denver. So he was great, you know. We just had a. And you met him in Baltimore. So I didn't meet him. Oh, afterwards I met him, but, but I didn't know him, right? But that's where you fir he first picked you up. I met him in Millersville, the third oh, okay. ride, which is about an hour outside of Baltimore. Yeah. I didn't even know what Millersville was. It kind, of, it kind of reminded me of the scene in The Jerk uh, when you first get started. I think like, the first guy took you like down the block or something. Well, the <laughs> first ride was a great African American Tracy Turnblad kind of gal with her baby going to daycare. And she said, I can't take any further because I have to go to work. But she was lovely, and um, it was pouring rain. That's the thing. I did a lot of research to find out the most moderate temperature on Route 70, which was this week in May. But the thing I didn't look up is it rains every day. So the first two days, I stood there literally in pouring down rain. I thought, I'm going to kill myself. What book is this? You know. So you never got sick or anything? No. Wow. We mean mentally. <laughs> that happened a long time ago. Oh, hard sick. My friend told me the other day. Just lower it a little okay, more. and um, he said, you know, when I was a child, I always got car sick, and you take the jacket off, look, and it's the color of the exact medicine I had to oh, take yeah, as a yeah. child. I think that was accidental. <laughs> right. So, did you uh, learn about like for you? What were the worst? I mean, what did you learn to be the best techniques to hitchhike? But the sign humor didn't work. I had one that said, I'm not psycho. People laughed, but they didn't pick me up. Uh, <laughs> writing a book really didn't work because then they think, well, I'm, you know, about what? And they want their own private life. Something that is, when it didn't work if I was starting out in Baltimore and said San Francisco, it was like a joke. You had to have a, a possible end. So, end of Route 70, even though it was 2,000 miles or something, at least meant please take me a long way, but it was possible. So it had to be, and at the end of every day, I always never wanted to hitchhike at night. So the trick was where you get dropped off always. So at the end of every day, I wanted a place that had a motel. So I made the sign that said, next motel, and I felt like a hooker, you know? So I just changed it to hotel, even though there weren't any hotels. But it seemed much more, less tawdry. Yeah. Uh, in the first, uh, the first of the sort of, uh, that the best thing that could happen, uh, you 
you were immediately given was a five million dollars yeah. by a drug dealer to make your next film, yeah. uh, Fruitcake. Because that that's a movie that's sort that of that is a movie I've been trying, trying to make that didn't get made. So who knows? Maybe someone will read the book and send me the check. They gave it to me in cash <laughs> and, and said that I would never have notes, not to worry. <laughs> You know, it was like a joke of the best possible producer you could ever get. And we really don't care if it makes money. But it, and they own a, they own a, um, a criminally corrupt FedEx office that only deals in their drugs. And, um, and the people who work there look like they escaped from a you know Whole Foods jail. <laughs> you know that look. Are, are we ever going to see that film, or is, is, is what's what's kind of the state of a, a low budget kind of independent film right now? Oh, it's bad. You know, I mean, like TVs were. Is better now, really, yeah. you know, um, where people see it, and uh, so no, the independent film world that I know is no longer. They want, they're looking for me when I was twenty. They'd like me to make a film with the budget of polyester, certainly. Which was how much? Three hundred thousand. Which today would be probably six hundred thousand. Would you ever consider doing a Kickstarter? No, public begging. I, I can't. Know. I can't. You know, I own, the guy I own three homes. <laughs> no, but I own three homes. Well, as much as I want to go to Occupy Baltimore, I can't be that hypocritical. <laughs> You know, really. Um, you know, and I don't hate all rich. There's asshole poor people I know, too. You know, it's even you know, there's good and bad in both, really. But I liked Occupy Baltimore. I get why they're going there the same way I went to Black Panther riots in the 60s to have sex, to take drugs. I understand the tribal fun of a riot. What was on uh, in the fic fictional part? You witnessed. Uh, sorry, you referenced. Sorry, I just got a plane from Russia, so I'm a little uh, stupid. I'm also stupid in real life. But uh, you referenced the uh, soundtracks a lot in the. Yeah, uh, the book has a playlist at the end, which you can go and look up online and play all the music. And it's oddly enough, all music about hitchhiking is country music, almost all of it, except for the famous hitchhike song by Marvin Gaye. But uh, I found some great ones, really obscure hitchhike records. That I, I always have a soundtrack for everything I do, even when I'm walking down the street, kind of in my head. I think we need a soundtrack. Going to Google. Going yeah. To Google. yeah. What the hell is this? Um, is there a Google dance yet? There should be. Oh, yeah, totally. Nobody goes, but yeah. <laughs> everybody looks at their computer and works. Oh, you mean like a dance? Like a, a function? Yeah, or yeah like, like a twist. Everybody's no. doing oh, like, like Google. Yeah. No, there's a, a gimmick dance, like a Google. You should make one. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a hacker. You know, I would say uh, I want a hacker break then because they're always home up there in that room with the door closed, waiting to put the food outside where they're shutting down the government of foreign countries. <laughs> There's some people doing a dance over there. That's uh, you'll see everybody doing that during the day. Right. It's a very antisocial dance. <laughs> <laughs> what were people listening to in the uh, in their cars when you really got almost it? never was the radio on. When a hitchhike, when you pick up, they want to talk. They want yeah. yeah. So I don't remember ever the radio being on on one car that ever picked me up. With here we go, magic, a rock group that picked me up that I did not know, and they accidentally picked me up. They played my mixtape, and they gave me their tape, but I played that alone in the motel. We didn't play it in front of them. Were they a good band? Did yeah, they know? are. Good. Okay, because yeah, yeah. I was really liking them in the book, and I was like, that'd be terrible if they were awful. Well, I wouldn't have minded if I was a terrible band either. I would have gotten in, believe me. I wasn't like standing as long as I was like, let me hear a hit first. <laughs> yeah. No thanks. Oh, oh, oh it's yeah. Tickleback. Keep yeah. driving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, you, um, this is spoiler alert, in the, in the, uh, worst that could happen part, you actually describe your own death at the hands yeah. of a, uh... Well, don't tell them the whole thing. Okay, okay. Can I tell them Well, if you think of the worst, and you're hitchhiking, obviously you get killed, yeah. Okay. In Las Vegas. Can I tell them <laughs> about the, the movie that's playing in hell? Oh, no. Oh. The last one. All right, all right. Pay to play, people. Pay to play. All right. But I do imagine um, the person that kills me, you know, I always said that most serial killers, their type isn't a 66-year-old film, film cult director. <laughs> but in the book, there is one, right? Who's <laughs> only looking for that. Is it like Leonard Maltin or something? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, what's the most shockingly mainstream thing that you're a fan of? That's a good one. I'm not all, um, hmm. Shoes. I just felt really like 3D. I, I'm for all 3D. I like 3D. But I went to see things like, what was the, 
Come with the big tits. Oh, Piranha? Piranha 3D. Well, that was great. That was what it was called. And I went the last night of the run, and I was alone in the theater. Watching Piranha 3D with, sun, with 3D glasses, I looked like such a fool. I was the only person in the theater for a 10 o'clock show the last day. But I didn't miss it. I'm also a big fan of all Final Destination movies. I love them. Oh, those are great. Yeah. yeah. Are there going to be any more hitchhiking adventures in your future? I hope not. If I miss a flight. <laughs> um, no, once I did it, I don't have to do it again. But you all should do it. You should try hitchhiking. I think um, it is a little adventure. You could do it on your summer vacation. And, and uh, you know, and if you get murdered, it's not my fault. But, but you could get murdered in the car accident. I'm scared of staying home. Yeah. That's If you never go out either, that's more dangerous than taking a chance hitchhiking. Because yeah. nothing new will ever happen to you. Do you think uh, if you had have done, would, it, would this have been easier to do in the 70s than now? Would you, even if you weren't famous, like, did, yeah. do you think it was harder um, now? Or in the old days, the problem was there was so many hitchhikers. Like, there were places, New Haven was a famous place where there would be 100 rise. hitchhikers there. So it was better for that. There was no competition. But the younger you are, the better chance you have a ride, certainly, to get them. Yeah. And, and I was in the one truck stop, because I was talking to a guy checking in, and I said, that really, truckers can't pick you up now, because they have two in the truck, and this trucker was standing by me. He said, if you had a vagina, they would. <laughs> that's that's oh. true. <laughs> um, where are you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, the Corvette, I want to talk a little bit about the Corvette kid here. Yeah. Um, do you still keep in touch with him? I do. He came to my Christmas party. He's looking great, yeah. Does he really, does he look like Justin Bieber or? No, but I'm a fan of Justin Bieber's too. Um, even more so now. That is like really, yeah, yeah. He's Bizzle. No, Bizzle's going to be his rap name. That makes me really love him. Bizzle, I want to hear his rhymes. Oh, I love it when he's black. So, uh, just looking at your sort of body of work, it seems like you're always busy. Are you kind of thinking forward, forward to your next thing after you get through this huge... Yeah, I got next things already. I'm yeah. both for the next year. You know, I've spoken to a show called The Sculpey World. I do all over the world. I have a Christmas show. I got 20 in December coming up. I'm having an art show at Brian Bosky Gallery in one London. Um, I have another big project that I can't announce yet that's coming, and maybe another one that I'm writing this summer. So, yeah, I got a job. Where do you find the time for all this? Um, that's a good question. I'm highly organized. Are you? Yeah, but Monday to Friday, I get up every morning at 6 a.m. I read all the newspapers. I still read newspapers. Um, and then I, my job is every morning to think up something fucked up, and i got to sell up in the afternoon. Monday to Friday, I drink one day a week. So I'm a workaholic five, an alcoholic one, and the other day I take off. And my shrink says, that sounds like a good plan to me. Is there, is there like one uh, sort of guiding, like book or film that you kind of are, are aiming towards, like that you have to sort of, that sets the bar for you in everything you do? No, not really, because when I grew up, certainly Janae and Tennessee Williams and all those kind of people, which I wrote about in my last book, Role Models, all mm -hmm. the people that kind of gave me the, I don't know, the courage to try to do what I wanted to do. Um, so, no, I think those kind of things happen to you when you're young. You know, today I love Michel Fellback. I love his novels. Um, I'm reading this one from Norway, the six-volume one, My Struggle, which is great, by the way. So um, I like to read. Yeah, that's what I do for relaxation. Do you still, uh, do you write your books in the same way that you do your films? Yeah, I write everything on a special kind of legal pad with big pens and scotch tape, and then my assistant puts it in the computer the first draft, and then I cut it up again. Yeah, I do it the same just way. Just in pen and log hand. Just right in log hand, Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. There's a lot, it seems like there's a lot of guys like that do that. I think Arthur Miller. It doesn't matter how you write it. You know, you could yeah. use your head on a blackboard as a human <laughs> typewriter. As long as you write it, it doesn't matter. Nobody asks. At the end, how did you do that book? You know, it's like, and never in my life has anybody that's ever paid me one penny ever asked me if I went to school. Did you go to school? No. I had <laughs> trouble. And so, but that's lucky. I didn't want to be a doctor. You know, I'm glad that I'm not a doctor. No one asked. Well, you were at NYU, and then you got uh, you got kicked out. Yeah, it wasn't NYU school. You know, because yeah. I took 
acid every day and just stole books and then resold them in the bookstore in the afternoon. <laughs> Should've, they should have thrown me out. Well, you were working. It wasn't like you were working. You wanted no, to I didn't even went to class. I just took drugs and went to the movies every day, but not Potemkin, which they showed us over and over. But nowadays, and we was great. I could go there. You could make a snuff film and get an A. <laughs> We have, a, we have a mic there for audience questions. If you have a question, you can just kind of circulate over there and uh, call on you. You can yell it out. You don't have to do it. You can do that. I think they're doing that for audience. Oh, okay. For audience. So, go ahead. I have your uh, Christmas record compilation. Thank you. It's a very special place in my heart. Oh, can you thanks. describe how you chose all those songs, where you found them? Well, I always liked weird novelty songs and hillbilly records and old rhythm and blues, and so I, I just looked for every weird Christmas carol I could find. And um, the one song, I'm Fat Daddy, was the main black disc jockey in Baltimore, where in Hairspray, they joked they had Negro Day. They really did have that. And he was the host of Negro Day. And that was his song, I'm Fat Daddy, I'm Santa Claus. And then the other song, Santa Claus is a Black Man. Um, I love that song. And the... Uh, the governor of Maryland, O'Malley, when he was the mayor, turned on the Christmas lights of all of Baltimore downtown with me and the mayor, and they played that as the introduction, which was great and very fitting for Baltimore. Yeah. Anybody else? Just real quick, as he gets up here, uh, Mark's from around Baltimore, and he does this. We're always wondering, like, how do you not have the, that accent? I think I probably do have. Do, they I do the accent, is it? Um. Well, when I'm trying to think. Here's every every. <laughs> A uh, person answers the phone in Baltimore. My name then. Well, we, uh, my family and I, we go to Ocean City, Maryland every every summer, and yeah. the, there's this commercial in this place called the Purple Moose Saloon. It's the home of hard rock in Ocean City. Yeah. It's like awesome. everybody's mouth seems like it's a small hole well, that they're trying to get words out of. And Pink Flamingos, I make fun of that. I'm the narrator in the beginning. Yeah. You know, well, Dr. Baltimore actually Baltimore. did a pretty good job in the, yeah. in the remake of the... Yeah. It's the Baltimore <laughs> accent is really grating. Philadelphia is very close, though. It sounds yeah. similar. All regional accents can be grating unless yeah. you're in the mafia. Yeah, <laughs> I noticed... New York. That, they kind of sound good. Yeah, I noticed that in, like, the, none of the people in The Wire, they were like, yeah, don't talk like that. that nobody's going to think you're <laughs> the Wire is so great. It's my favorite television show that's ever. Amazing. Everybody know I worked on it. But um, well, that's black. That's a different kind of Baltimore accent. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes, sir. Hi. Uh, so I've never actually seen any of your work, but I did. Uh, I did see you on the Big Thing. I did see an interview uh -huh. on the Big Thing. I was really intrigued by that. So where should I start in the John Waters info to maximize? Uh, it depends. Do you want to go low or high? You know, if you want to. I would, I, say, I would say female trouble and serial mom. And serial mom. They're very, one was very early and one was very late, but I think they kind of sum up everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, on a personal note, I, first time I saw female trouble, I was, it was like, I felt like it was the first time I heard the sex pistol. I was like laughing, but I was also scared. And my room, and my new roommate showed it to me, so I was, then I was scared of him. But it, was, yeah. <laughs> it was great, though. Okay. Thank you for coming. Um, I hate asking questions and talk, so I, I wrote mine down. All right. <laughs> but, um, so I would have read Carsick last night, but it wasn't published yet. So Today's I, the day. Yeah, so congratulations. Thank you. And I, I read Role Models instead. And uh, so you wrote about Leslie Van Houten. I did. And uh, That's kind of a serious subject. Yeah, well, it was about. really difficult. Well, it was difficult for me to... And, then, and your next chapter is, is about your sense of passion. It was really hard for me to go from one chapter to the next. But, um, so you, you, right, you talk about how she's still in jail and she's repeatedly denied parole. And and you make it clear that you think it's been too long. You even say that... I make it clear that Leslie Van Helden is one of the three original Manson women that has been in jail for, I don't know, since 1969. She looks back on it with horror, but she did. And... Uh, and has taken full responsibility. She is my friend. I've visited her for a long time. I believe she did not get her first trial. She got the death penalty. Her second trial it was, she was overthrown. She got a hung jury for diminished capacity. And the third trial, she was found guilty. So she got life. She did not get life without parole. She said, if I got life without parole, I would never ask. But she has done, they have repeatedly told her for 40 years, you're eligible parole if you do everything. And she has a great record. She's done everything, the shrinks, everything. And they won't let her out. And I understand. I don't ever criticize the victims. They have the right. I understand why they don't think she should get out. 
But from society's viewpoint, I do believe that she has paid her price. Yeah, she met a madman, one of those notorious madmen. She doesn't say that. She says that she's equally as guilty because you cannot have a cult leader without followers. I question that. I think she was 17 when she met him. You know, in 1969, which is probably the most insane year that's going to go down in this 1900s, the whole, you know, 100 years. So, yeah, and she does well in prison, too. She teaches people to read. She does all this stuff. Which is an excellent summary of the chapter. But the question is... My question is... Do you have a question? I do have a question. It seems to me that you would... So that you have this chapter in your book, and only a number of people are going to read that chapter. No, they read my book, usually. What I mean to say is that you would probably make a better case, and you would have a wider influence if you were to write an entire book about it. And so I was surprised that it's just in one chapter as opposed to its own book. Well, it's the biggest chapter in the book. I think it's 40,000 words or something. It was run on the Huffington Report in five different parts it ran. I don't know. My book was about people that influenced me for surviving things, including Johnny Mathis, you know, surviving great success early and still having a great life. Leslie having this terrible thing that she did, and how do you live with that? So it was all the people that really affected me. So I didn't want to write a book just about that. I wanted to, yes, and the next chapter is about fashion, and there's a chapter about marine porn. You know, it's very different worlds to me, but they all are brave in a weird way. They've survived something. And I'm always like people that have had more extreme lives than I've had. It's more interesting. It's always interesting to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone have a hairspray question? <laughs> Why not? Where did, Why Where did you discover Edith Massey? In um, a bar called Pete's Hotel that you can see in Multiple Maniacs if you're going to require a copy. That's where she worked. She was a barmaid. And Vincent Perenio and Susan Lowe, who were great friends who were in my early movies, uh, introduced me to her. And there is a chapter, I don't want to give anything away, very much about her in the new book, Carson. Just as a side, I also know a guy who did marine porn. Who did what? Marine porn. Oh, was it Bobby? The one I wrote? Okay, well, I don't even know Bobby. <laughs> and I don't know where he is today. He's underground, so I don't know. But I did get dropped off for checking in some military community, and I thought, maybe he's here. I can stay with him. Oh, I thought you meant, like, like sea life. <laughs> I swear, I really thought that was... You're talking about armed forces military. We're talking about sea food. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, I did want to ask you, what do you think happened to Hitchcock? When I was a kid, I remember my parents picking up people. And when I was in high school and college and even through my age, yeah. that's how people got yeah. around. I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that hitchhiker, <laughs> had a lot to do with it. Um, and the hitcher and serial killers and, you know, the, the fact that there are serial killer truckers that have picked up women and killed them. So I think it just got to become a cliche of, of danger, really. So I suppose, in a way, we're, we're doing stuff like that with things like rideshare and Airbnb and things like that sort of gives it a, a cloak of safety. Maybe, yeah. But also, isn't hitchhiking green? I would think yeah, it is, green. certainly. It's beyond carpooling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, thanks. Now, now somebody's going to somebody's gonna make the Airbnb horror movie. Ruin that. <laughs> <laughs> Craig's this killer. I, I, I think he was waiting. <laughs> back. Oh, I have a Go question. Um, you know, my my favorite line from all movies is from one of your movies. Oh, thank it's, you. Which it's, one? It's from Female Trouble. Um, the line is, um, I wouldn't suck your lousy dick if I was suffocating and there was oxygen in your bore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, <damn> line. <laughs> I like the one in Desperate Living when he says, I'd like to stick my whole head in your mouth and have you suck out my eyeball. <laughs> That's a good one. Both of them, Angie. It's like Oscar Wilde. I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite line from movies? Oh, I don't know. Because, you know, there's a whole chapter in here with somebody I pick up and they refuse to talk to me except for lines from my movie, which drives me crazy. <laughs> It happened to me once, I really exaggerated, but uh, my, the most obscure line is when Mink asked David Lockery something, and he just says, and 
which means no, that's my favorite <laughs> line. And we use it around my office all the time. And we say it. I thought of you the other day because I was watching The Prodigal with Lana Turner. Mm -hmm. And I know you're a big Lana Turner fan. Did you ever well, see I'm this? even more fan of your daughter Cheryl Green, who is my mm -hmm. friend. Yeah. Did you ever see this one? Yes. Oh, you know it. That's so long ago, I don't know what. I don't know each line. No, but I mean, it's hilarious how it's ancient Judea and she walks around in high heels and a slit skirt. And, you know, you know. Lana was great. I met her at a Thanksgiving dinner with Lana Turner once for Cheryl and her that. girlfriend. It was quite a night. <laughs> All right, see you. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, like, what inspired you for the character names? The character names, I love to name them. I have to think up their names. Like, Ready Whip, or you'll see why I named them that one. Um, Lucas, I like names. I like um, Tarantula, somebody's baby's name in it. Um, Randy Packer, that's the one who kills me. So I, I, I don't know. I have to have their name first. And I have this one baby book from the 50s names that I've used for, I've almost used every one of them. I, there's a little check spot. You can see all the names. I, use, I have about five or six of them, but there's one I like best, and it's an old Dell book that was 25 cents, Name Your Baby, from the 50s. That's where I get a lot of them. And the last name, I just hear them, or I, I meet somebody, and, and I don't know. And the lawyers always go through and make sure there's nobody with both names, first and last, in your city, definitely in movies. Well, like Hairspray, um, did you, like, most of their names were like the first and last or the same letter? Well, I had that alliteration, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Tracy, Tim, Bob, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, so you, you seem to be pretty fascinated by crime, just in general. Well, I, I yes, I mean, I taught in prison. Um, I would be a good defense lawyer. Mm. Um, but I've changed that some, and I apologize that for role models and kind of, you know, dedicating pink flamingos to the Manson family and stuff. And I realized later that that was really unfeeling to the victim. So I did change after I taught in prison for a long time. I don't have a favorite crime. I'm not for it. But I must admit, Today I read this story that broke about these two girls on the internet that killed their girlfriend, believing that some fantasy they were going to go to, and they're 12 years old, I mean, and they thought that they were going to go live with this wizard somewhere. It's an amazing story. Yeah. Has, has there ever been any... Uh, <laughs> well, to me it is. No, I didn't, I didn't read it. <laughs> just, I didn't feel bad news. <laughs> has it been, have you had any kind of rough interactions with, with criminals and have you ever sort of... No. No? What do you mean rough? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I get along with them usually. <laughs> All right. I mean, some, you know, I pick and choose. <laughs> there, There's a part in the book where you kind of talk about possibly, uh, well, it's, it's kind of as a throwaway line of, of the next book maybe being you retrying all the drugs that you... Yeah, I don't think I'm going to do that. I, I try every drug I ever took in order. <laughs> but some of them, you know, do I really want LSD 68? I don't know. I think I've had enough inner journeys. Yeah. Um, I think I, I just want to add one last thing before we, we if anybody wants a book, there, did you know about that? Okay. The books, uh, there's a few more for sale. I know a bunch of you have bought them already. There's a few more. I think there's actually four for sale back there. I'm pushing them. I'm pushing them. Very good. And I'll sign them if you want. And, uh, you know, yeah, he'll be here to sign, uh, but we can take another, do you have another question? Oh, I just wanted to talk to you about the, the sort of, uh, the tone of your, of your films. Oh, it seems to be very consistent, and I always wonder, you know, we make videos, we make comedy videos, and how do you get people to sort of, is, is there a John Waters acting school? Well, it used to be shouted as loud as you can. It was like sense around, you know. But today, I, I think I go for a very different kind of style. I, I always, the main thing I said is we're making a comedy. Don't wink at the audience. Say it like you believe every line is completely true. That's why, I, except for Tracy Ullman, I almost never hired comedians to play the part. Because I don't want them winking at the audience. So, um... It's the same, the tone in my book is the same. The, the, in Car Sick, I want it to just be like I'm telling you stories. And, and I think it comes across like that. The tone I always want is, this is my world, and I come in it, and I, I think you'll be safe if I'm your guy. Yeah. Is there, well, I noticed like you work with Johnny Knoxville, and for some reason, I don't know why, but that just seems right. He just seems like somebody who'd be right for if whatever. If Brian hadn't eaten dog shit, he would have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some obvious thing, reasons for that, but there's people like Kathleen Turner where you're like, yeah, I get it. Like, can, what makes a great John Waters leading man or woman? 
Well, but they have a sense of humor. They don't use the word journey or craft too much. <laughs> Thanks for taking us on this journey about your craft. <laughs> and uh, if you want to, uh, <laughs> I think, yeah. should we do books now? Yeah, yeah uh, he's, John's going to be up here to sign some books and uh, you can chat with him. And, uh, I'll have a round of applause for John Wiseman.